Hey everyone, Chris Sawyer here. The Varival Show is back. Welcome. Uh, right now I'm sitting next to my great friend, John's Company. We are here in St. Helena, California. You guys might know that from Napa Valley. Yep. Um, John and I are going to talk about some fun things, and this being the Chenin Blanc that he makes. And then we're going to talk about another grape variety called Cabernet Franc. Anyone ever hear about that grape? Uh, well, if you haven't, you're sure, certainly going to on this show today, uh, because John is one of my favorite people in the world um, that Thank makes you, um, uh, Cabernet Franc, and he just happens to be here in Napa. <laughs> um, so here we are at your favorite little place, um, which is basically your your little um, your little area here, which is where you pour your wine. Yeah, this is the, the tasting salon at Spring House, which is located right in the heart of St. Helena, across the street from one of Chris's favorite bars, uh, I'm sorry, restaurants, uh, Goose and Gander. The bar is awesome. And uh, we operate a really nice little hospitality program. It's a very cozy 1902 Victorian, and uh, you can come and taste uh, Chenin Blanc and Cabernet Franc and, and meet the family here. Yeah. Here, here, cheers to that. Yeah, exactly. So, um, before we get into why you love Chenin Blanc and why we love Chenin Blanc, and then we'll go into the Cabernet Franc, what the hell brought you here to St. Helena and Napa Valley in general? Aren't you a Midwesterner? Yeah, oh yeah. Sometimes I have to pinch myself <laughs> thinking that I should have come here when I was retiring, not when I was in my 20s. But <laughs> both my wife Tracy and I are, are transplanted Midwesterners. Kansas City was my last stop, and she grew up there. Uh, we both, uh, we met when we were in school and both wound up working in restaurants through college. And about three quarters of the way through school, when we got to be about 21, we both got bit by the wine bug and its affinity with foods. We were working in finer and finer uh, dining. After we got married, we moved back to Kansas City and uh, Tracy actually was one of the first uh, women sommeliers. They actually in Kansas City didn't call us sommeliers, they called us wine stewards. Uh, but actually had a job as a wine steward buying and selling wine on the restaurant floor about a year before I did it. And, wow. uh, we really uh, did more than a deep dive on, on fine wine, uh, operating in a couple different restaurants in Kansas City. Uh, in late 1979, we made our first trip to California, came up to Napa Valley for a few days, uh, totally fell in love, um, and realized that this might be a place for us. And... Less than a year and a half later, uh, I wound up getting a great job in San Francisco working for a really cool fine wine marketing company and uh, kind of did my graduate work with this company. We worked with, did the national sales for Chateau Magdalena, Chateau St. Jean, Sutter Home, Stonegate, Raymond, Parducci, McDowell, all North Coast County wineries. And I can remember um, times that we drive up here, I always said to Tracy, you know, honey, one day we're going to be driving on our way home. And in 1984, we moved to St. Helena. I worked for the likes of the Wagner family at Camus, uh, Bernard Porte at Clos de Vol. My last legitimate paying job, as Tracy <laughs> refers to it, I was the general manager of the Nibong Coppola estate. While I was working with them, I, I came across the feeling that at some point that Tracy and I wanted to make some wine together. And we decided to focus on Cabernet Franc, we had felt that it had never really gotten its dues. Um, we were very familiar with uh, the great uh, Cabernet Francs, not only used as a tool in Bordeaux, but also a uh, standalone in the Loire Valley. And one of my great mentors was Dan Duckhorn, who was helping me uh, climb the chairs at the Napa Valley Vintners Association. And I was selling grapes to him from Coppola's, and I started a conversation with him about starting our own production. And he told me point blank, he said, well, be sure you pick a variety you like, because if you can't sell it, you're going to have to drink it. In That's addition, a good motto, you guys. Is, in addition to that, I, I looked at his playbook and just tore page one out, which was find one variety you like, focus on it, become the expert at it. So here was Duckhorn Merlot. And then I said to myself, Cabernet Franc would be something we would really like to explore. Another one of my mentors was Dick Ward, who... Uh, being a Pinot Noir producer in Napa Valley was not an easy thing. Sainsbury. Yep. Sainsbury co-founder. Right. And he told me that uh, he would, he and his partner, Dave, were the ones who kind of said, you know, you kind of have permission uh, to not do what people expect you to do, which would have been to make Cabernet Sauvignon. 
So in 1993, uh, Tracy and I bought a couple tons of grapes from a friend of ours in Oakville, made the wine at Etude under the tutelage of Tony Soder, and realized that we had something a little bit different, a little bit special. And in 1996, we put the gauntlet down and started Wine and Read. Yeah. And that's about right where I was working at Winex Magazine. Right. And uh, we were just getting off the ground there. And I, I feel like I was right there with you. I, I've been following your wines since they were first released. And that's amazing, you know? Well, Winex Magazine also had a broader scope of, of what you guys yeah. thought was is real. This, is the this wine technically business. your 25 year anniversary? It is, exactly. Oh. It was 25 years, our legal anniversary. Legal. Right. We did drink all the, most of the 93 ourselves, uh, <laughs> but it did, a little bit got out of the market later when we, when we became legal in, legal in 96. Fast forward 20 vintages, having made only, up to that point only two versions of Cabernet Franc, a early to market red, a Vandelonet, and a more aged style, Van de Garde. Uh, my older son, Reed, uh, this is aptly named after the middle names of both my boys, uh, Jersey Lang, Lang and Scupney, and yeah. John Reed Scupney. Um, it, they were both maternal family names on our families, Reed oh, on my cool. side and Lang on my mother's side. And Scupney seemed to be something we should save for the pickle company yeah. instead of fine wine. So uh, Reed decided he wanted to be a winemaker sometime after he got out of high school and left St. Molina for a while and wound up doing his last internship in the Loire Valley. Mm. He was there with his fiancée, my daughter-in-law, Megan. And they did, in addition to an exploration of Cabernet Franc, they also both got bit by the Chenin Blanc bug and asked the question when we came over for their wedding in March of what happened to Shannon in, in California. Yeah. And I sat back and I thought, you know, it's really a shame because when I moved here in 1980, there were 2,800 acres of Shannon Blanc in Napa Valley. Just in Napa Valley alone, there were 50,000 acres of Shannon Blanc in California in 1980, and there were less than 10,000 acres of Chardonnay. Right. Can you believe that, you guys? It's completely not that way now. <laughs> yeah. Today, in Napa Valley, there are 7,000 acres of Chardonnay mm -hmm. and 15 acres of Chenin Blanc. Yes, exactly. And the same is held true without, throughout the rest of the North Coast. Um, and there are pockets where it's sort of seeing a renaissance yeah. uh, down in the South Central Coast. There's some great yeah. plantings. Yeah, and, and Clarksburg Absolutely. is probably the biggest uh, concentration of Chenin Blanc. I don't think there's a doubt about that. Truly. And but yours comes from a very special little zone up there in Mendocino yeah, County. This is a unique vineyard. It uh, it's up in Talmadge. Talmadge is about seven miles south of Ukiah, in uh, on the, what we call the Talmadge Bench, which is a, a rise off of the valley floor uh, that runs along the Russian River. Yeah, a little bit east of the river, just exactly. uh, like a stone's throw. It's tucked right between the Russian River and the, the city of 10,000 Buddhists. So we've yeah. always thought this had really good vibes. So. Yeah. Have you ever eaten in the ten, church? I haven't. 10,000 Buddhists. It's a really great place. If you guys get up there and if it's open, go have yeah. lunch there. It's unbelievable. I've read great things about it, but they have yet to reopen from the pandemic. There's but a lot look. of peacocks there, though. I just right. want to tell you before you go. There's a lot of peacocks. Anyways, this vineyard was planted for John Parducci, actually, in 1980. So it's over 40 years old. It's a beautiful old head prune goblet style uh, vineyard on the slopes, um, very rocky soils. And uh, there's about four and a half acres and there might be five or six of us producing wines from this particular vineyard. Yeah. Uh, Shannon Block has become- I know Dane Sellers is yep. one of them. Um, Bart Hansen, talking about you, brother. Yeah. Um, you know, it takes me back to, you know, just smelling this takes me back to the Loire Valley. I mean. I got the opportunity to go there a number of times. Um, if any of you know the Vouvray and the area of Vouvray, which is tends to be a little bit sweeter version of this, um, and very age-worthy versions of, of Chenin Blanc, it's a really special area. But when you get these kinds of drier styles, I mean, there's something about Loire Valley that is very, very special in France. It's actually where the Parisians go when they're on vacation. <laughs> they eat a lot of food there. And there's castles everywhere. There's troglodytes running around. No, they, they're not still around, but <laughs> the caves but, are. But the caves are. And you can stay in <laughs> and their the caves. Mushrooms too. Yeah, the mushrooms are everywhere. And you have a lot of Michelin star restaurants oh, there. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's where beef bourguignon, or, or not, um, it's um, 
oh god what's our other castle that's uh, beef um uh, uh i can't remember but it's one of the beef styles i'll probably remember once we get to the cabernet <laughs> front um uh but it is it, that castle that the beef is named after is there too and so is merlin's um uh, there's a little part where merlin's tomb is apparently and you know we were there i, I we're like all oh, okay so what happens now we just came down to a creek and we took uh, my wife and I, soon to be wife, and I took a little sprinkle of the water and went like this. Oh, wow. Oh, I feel so different. And we looked up and there was a double rainbow. <laughs> what? I guess Merlin did exist, you know? But... It is truly a magical place. <laughs> Being ex Midwesterners, we always say it's really great because it has sort of a Midwestern appeal to it. We know that some of the best goat cheeses in the world oh, yeah. are grown there, are grown there, are produced there. Again, the mushrooms are there. Yeah. The middle Loire, where Loire, where Vouvray, Mont Louis, uh, Jasenier make really, really beautiful white wines, beautiful Chenin Blanc, and then just to the little bit to the west is Chinon, Bourget, Saint Nicolas de Bourget, and Samour. Samour does both. Oh yeah. Uh, just truly a, a garden paradise in Paris or in in France. Yeah. And, and it's pretty much Paris. it's pretty much directly due west of yeah. Paris. So. Uh, it's about a three-hour drive, maybe about a two-hour train. Trip. Yeah, it's beautiful. easier by train, but just a beautiful area. And, and here we are in, in Sonoma County, uh, Napa Valley, and Mendocino County, where we still have some of this left. Um, and this one's from Mendocino County. I love this. I've always loved it since you came Thank out you. with it. When did you release the first bottling of this? So Reed and Megan came back in 2009, and it took us about three years to find a source because... I really wanted to stay in the North Coast counties. Mm -hmm. It's where our home has been for a long time, and I've, I've known the known sources of, of where grapes come from. And having actually worked with this vineyard back in the early 80s when John Carducci was getting the grapes or sold the wine from there, uh, I knew that this was really a really fantastic source. So 2013 was the first year we made Chenin Blanc. In 14, a vineyard here in Napa Valley came available to us. It was a 0.9 acre vineyard that produced about three and a half tons in the Oak Knoll region. Mm -hmm. And we did the Napa Valley bottling from 14 to 18. We've done the Mendocino since 13 and continue to. The Napa Valley vineyard, unfortunately, was pulled in 2018. So we had a five year run with it. We, they are significantly different wines. One, this one is a really bright, fresh, bracy, and this is the you know, the oyster wine to oyster wines. Mm -hmm. um, both the wines, both our Shenans are barrel fermented. They're done in a very, you know, kind of unique style. Our intent is to produce something that's very typical for, for Chenin Blanc. That's usually the very stone fruit kind of aromatics, a little bit of honey, a yeah. uh, little bit of floral, almost a little jasmine to it. This Mendocino tends to have a little more saline, and so it's as an oyster wine or a shellfish wine, it's just a really beautiful match. Yeah. The Napa's a little richer and deeper, tends to do better with entree items, yeah. roast quail, you know, sole meunier, those types of things. But it's a beautiful bridge between Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. That's Sauvignon right. Blanc, I love, I love its bracing mm -hmm. acidity and its herbaceousness. I like Chardonnays when they're rich, uh, but complex without too much buttery, Mm -hmm. tones to it. Shenan sits right between those things as something that's just a little bit more teasing. There's a lot of complexity to, to Shenan Blanc. There's a lot of different styles. There yeah. are porch pounders that are done in stainless <laughs> steel. There are sparkling wines made from it. And some of the great dessert wines in the world are also made from Shenan. That's awesome. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of Shenan. And yeah. Thank you. whenever I do a, a Shenan tasting where we buy some of the high ends from the old world and um, or even from here, I always invite him. He will always be invited to those tastings that I set up. We always have to sharpen the saw again. Yes, right? we do. We do. <laughs> and speaking of uh, other ones, but once again, this is the, the bottling for that. And, and langenreed.com, you can find more great things, including what we're going to talk about next, right. Cabernet Franc. Here we go. Okay, so Cabernet Franc is one of our favorite grape varieties. Yep. Uh, for those of you that do not know this amazing fact, uh, Cabernet Franc is the father and uh, was crossed with Sauvignon Blanc to create a super grape called Cabernet Sauvignon. Ooh, that's where it comes from. Sauvignon Blanc is the Sauvignon part of Cabernet Sauvignon. 
and the Cabernet Franc is the Cabernet part exactly. of it. Go it's like figure. A, it's like a French hyphenated American. Yeah. So you know that Loire Valley is super important now. Um, but here we go. We go into the one that, you know, a lot of people can find this out there in the, um, uh, you know, if it's a really good wine shop, some nice restaurants across the nation can find this. But this is the Lang and Reed. This is the starter one from Cabernet Franc. You've done, uh, you know, North Coast and you've got California on this label. So you get some sourcing. Um, so tell us a little bit about this one sure. and this new vintage of it. This is the 2018 vintage of Lang and Reed. As I mentioned when we started, our model was the Loire. And that wasn't to make Loire wines in California or Napa Valley. We were inspired by the, by the styles that we saw there. Uh, we had both come up through Cabernet Rank, Cabernet Sauvignon producers here in Napa Valley. Uh, in addition to my experiences, Tracy spent a decade and a half with uh, the, the Novak family at Spotswood. Mm. Those were our inspirations to look at barrel tastings and seeing Franc alone. When you looked at a Cabernet Franc producer in the Loire Valley in the late 80s, early 90s, which was the model we were developing our thoughts about, most producers would produce two wines, a Vandelane, or Wine of the Year, and a van de garde or a wine to age. And as Chris told you, the Parisians play in the Loire Valley. So when they are back at home, when they're in their bistros and their cafes, they drink Cabernet Franc, and they generally drink what they consider the van de Lene style. Yeah. If you ordered a pichette or a wine by the glass in a, in, a, in a zinc bar, nine times out of 10, they're gonna pour you a glass of Cabernet Franc from yeah. the Loire. On the other hand, the Loire is, is equally diverse and maybe much more so even than the Napa Valley, but its, it's terroir is not unsimilar in the fact that there's hillside, benchland, and valley floor. Mm -hmm. And the valley floor tends to produce bright, fresh, mm -hmm. early to market reds. The, the benchlands and the hillsides produce much more complex wines. Yeah. They're, they're based on a, on, a, on a yellow and a white limestone basis. Uh, we have darker volcanics here, but not on similar soils. So we produced the Van de Lene, uh, from grapes in 2018, actually stretched out to a California appellation due to the fires that were happening here in the North Coast. And I wound up procuring some grapes from the Sierra foothills to augment what I couldn't use, uh, basically from Lake County. And that'll happen again in 19 and possibly 20. In 21, we're actually going to be able to come back into sort of our home base, which is the North Coast counties. Yeah. Unfortunately, our friends who supplied us the grapes from the Sierra foothills got hit this year in, in the Calder fire up in the Sierra foothills. So the, the beauty of that, of making this wine is it's a winemaker's dream that I, I source grapes from uh, upwards of five or six different vineyards, any one vintage, and I can blend it to a style that I prefer and basically what has become the Lang and Reed thumbprint. Yep. It's bright, fresh, it's not particularly heavy in tannin. It can, in the summertime, it works with a little bit of a chill on it, so you can drink it with your grilled salmon or Super. your, or your, or your uh, uh, flattering steak. Flattering steak, that's a joke. Flattering. <laughs> flattering steak. A flattering steak, yeah. Anyways, you it's, know it's, called that. it's sourced from uh, Sierra Foothills, uh, T-Bar T Ranch up in uh, Alexander Valley, and the Sugarloaf. Oh, no, T-Bar T. That was the old Sterling property, right? Isn't it? Right? Uh, to answer, to answer, answer, right, 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 yeah, right. Yep. It, yeah. exactly, exactly. We know that connection. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, it's um, as Chris said, this is what most people know us about. It's being sort of like retired hippies. We want to have a wine that we can afford ourselves. Yeah, I mean that looks pretty Parisian to me. I mean, I feel like I'm in, you know, in Europe, and and it just feels jolly and fun, and and it's actually just wonderful on the mouth. I mean, that's really what I like so much about it, why I've always had it at restaurants where I've been the sommelier and I always recommend it and I always love buying it when I get the opportunity. It just is super food friendly. Yeah, Franck in general is food friendly. It has a little bit lower tannin than some other reds, so it tends to cross the, the threshold of, of going into sort of more exotic foods, uh, fusion, something with a little heat. Um, when you have too much heat in a, in, a, in a food, it makes tannin a little bit bitter. But these tannins in, in Cabernet Franc are generally fruit tannins more than, than wood tannins combining. Um, That's great. So it tends to be ultimately gulpable is what Tony Soder used to say. Ultimately gulpable. Right. That is super quotable, you guys. So 
Now the yep. two fourteen, which is the middle line that we've got yep. here, Chris. This is the Saturday Sunday night or the Van de Garde. It's for special occasions like Saturday. Yep. You get your list, list of chores done. This is a by a contrast to the to the California. This is a single vineyard, single club. The vineyard is the Sugarloaf Mountain Vineyard down in the southeastern corner of Napa Valley on the eastern side right. where the Vaca Range uh, mountain range comes down to the northern reaches of San Francisco Bay. So it's an extremely cool, almost cold area in Napa Valley. It shares the same climate as the Caneros region, yep. but the soils are all hillside volcanic, so yep. they tend to be a little bit warmer. Right. It's uh, connected to the Vaca Mountains, whereas I always like to think that and say that um, Carneros is kind of the spine mm -hmm. of, of the Mayacamas. So they're on two different sides, even though they're looking at each other, but they both get the Petaluma Gap winds that come in and they're basically heading towards um, Central um, Valley of California. But I mean, I think what really enlightens me about it is it does get good afternoon sun, it gets yes. morning. Once it comes over those hills, it gets really good sun. It's The fog burns off a little bit faster. And really, you're one of the ones that really enlightened me about where it was going and, and before it even became an Appalachian. Yeah, um, this is special this, area. Yeah, this Coonsville. vineyard. Yeah, this vineyard is south of Coonsville. Um, it is. Uh, it was planted around the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. um, nobody believed that Bordeaux varietals uh, would thrive that far south because it is very cold district. Mm -hmm. But this has south. This whole area of the Sugarloaf Mountain. Uh, vineyard is becoming a very up and coming area due to this coolness that happens, and it has proved that up on the upper reaches, the Bordeaux varietals actually thrive really well. Well, I think that's a really important thing too to really look at this perspective. So, Loire Valley, much higher up than Bordeaux is. Um, so, we, we'd be talking about like the difference between here and um, up in Mendocino, something, or maybe Actually, even a little bit more like, more like Washington State. Washington State, yeah, yeah. quite a quite a bit up upwards um, north. But the fact is, um, it actually it actually performs well in good moderate to warm temperatures right. instead of hot, you know. But that's also one of the reasons that Cabernet Franc is in almost every great blend in Napa, oh, yeah. or not not in Napa Valley, but in Bordeaux. It's always a portion of, of that blend, if it's cab based or if it's Merlot based, it's always probably got some little bit of Cabernet Franc in it because it can actually be more balanced in, in certain years right. than, than the other ones can. What it, what it brings to an Uber blend or a Bordeaux blend, um, it brings aromatics because it's a very, very uh, aromatic red grape. It has a lot of perfume, oftentimes considered floral like violets. Um, it also has a higher range of fruit tones such as cherries, uh, berries, and strawberries where Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot tend to be more brooding, a little bit more dark cassis like black cassis or plum. So it appears to people that Cabernet Franc is higher in acid when in which it really isn't that much more. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really this fruit tone that gives you the impression that it is. So for Cabernet Sauvignon in particular, we joke as Cabernet Franc of feels that it makes Cabernet Sauvignon smell like it should. Yes. But secondarily, it gives lift to the fruit yeah. without adding more tannin, which Cabernet Sauvignon has a load yeah. of to begin with. Yeah, another great uh, producer that loves to use Cabernet Franc in almost every one of her Cabernet wines is Heidi Barrett mm -hmm. uh, Peterson, who we know very, very well. And when I do Cabernet Franc tastings, you know I invite Heidi Barrett along with him, of course, oh, yeah. and the great Pam Starr, of course. Right. We couldn't do it without Pam Starr. But the fact is, we all have a passion for this grape. And um, this wine, to me, I mean, this has got structure to it. It's got everything. I mean, I want a little lamb dish right now. I really do. Right. <laughs> I just, you know, I want a little grilled one, or maybe we just made, like, a little bit of lamb that we threw on the barbecue. Um, I think those you know, those lamb chops that they look like the silver dollars. Yeah. That and a little goat cheese with some greens on top would be a perfect combination. So the reason we call this 214 is it is directly related to the to the clone that's planted in this vineyard. And it's the Antov 214 clone, which came to California in the mid-90s. And it was a sort of lone clone that came from the Loire Valley. All the other Cabernet Franc clones up, at, up to that time that were brought here 
were generally sourced in the Bordeaux region. Today, in the you know in the mid twenties, I guess we call it now, or the Roaring Twenties, <laughs> we actually can get Cabernet Franc from a lot of different places, from Friuli, mm-hmm. different parts of Italy. We have a we even have uh, selections that have been brought back to California or to California from Argentina. So mm-hmm. there's a lot more diversity now, but this is a very specific clone called 214 that performs exceedingly well in the Loire Valley. And my experience with it, having worked with this fruit since 2007, is that before I worked with this, winemakers would tell me that Cabernet Franc suffers from having a hole in the middle, that it is the donut hole wine. And I've really attributed that a little bit, one, to the way we made the wines at yes. the time, and number two, the, the, the fruit sources or the clonal sources that we were able to have. And third was where they were being planted, because very rarely was Cabernet Franc or Merlot put into really yeah. great ground. Yeah. It was reserved for Cabernet Sauvignon. Well, I remember the um, seminar that you and I did at yeah. Napa Valley um, Wine Academy. Right. Um, and you and I were two speakers, and Pam Starr was sitting in the front. And we're like, oh, Pam Starr, tell us about this. Well, <laughs> you got to throw a star in the front, right? Right. But I felt like that point, there were really good wines in there in that, that flight that we had, the mass kind of big flight. I think it's just changed since then. I think yeah. you and I were the ones that actually – stuck the, the switch into the uh, so. wall and, and actually it inspired people to make better Cabernet Francs because Cabernet Franc is on, you guys. I mean, I think that this is the best we've ever seen it from America and especially from here in Napa Valley. I mean, there's some amazing yeah, things happening right now with Cabernet Franc. The range we can see today versus when Tracy and I started this 25 years ago. 25 years ago, we were hard-pressed to put together a tasting of six or eight wines from the North Coast County that were all Cabernet Franc. Uh, or varietally labeled as Cabernet Franc. Today, it could take us a couple days to get through them. Okay. Now, speaking of which, yeah. So let's go into the next one here. There we go. So tell us a little bit about this one. Well, so all three of these wines reflect Tracy's my ethos that we need to be able to afford our own wines. Um, Price-wise, the Mendocino Shannon is around thirty dollars retail. The Napa or the uh, California Franc is uh, twenty nine. The two fourteen single vineyard is eighty five. This is a unicorn for us. This is called Franc de Pied. This is a. I brought this up because I wanted to show Chris and explain to you guys that Cabernet. Everybody says, well, you know, it's a lighter wine than Cabernet Sauvignon, and it's not as tannic, and it can't possibly age as well. Well, age is a relative thing. It's relative to your palate, and it's re- relative to the producer or where it's coming from. Uh, this is a 10-year-old Cabernet Franc. This is a 2010 uh, called Franc de Pied, which means uh, foot of the Franc. And this came from a <laughs> vineyard which is no longer uh, on the face of the earth. It was planted in 1975 up in Lake County above Kelseyville. Yeah. Um, and it was planted on its own roots. Wow, which is a little didactic to get into now, but basically, ninety-eight percent of the grapevines in California or the New World are planted on grafted rootstock. Um, this was not, and I sourced these grapes. I first visited this vineyard in nineteen eighty-three when I was working for vintage wine merchants, and I was with Andre Chelichev and Bill Pease, and we recognized it. He said, that, "Andre said this is a great vineyard. It has red soil. It's on the flats. It's." beautifully aspect 20 years later 22 years later i'm walking the vineyard and i wound up buying the grapes for five years um, it did finally get affected by the root louse phylloxera which is why you don't put things on their own roots anymore um, and so the last year i uh, got grapes was 2010 okay. right before i bottled this because this was in our north coast modeling um, i decided that we're never going to see this fruit again and I stuck two barrels in the cellar in the really beautiful sylvan barrels nice. and waited another year and a half and bottled it. And then That's we wonderful. released it um, in 2000, just around Christmas time. Wow. I, I'm telling you guys, this is amazing uh, what it's tasting like. Um, and uh, it's just, uh, wow. Um, I mean, on the nose, it, it really reminds me so much of like if, if my grandmother, when she used to make her version of, of toffee, Oh, I mean, yeah. It's just got a beautiful oh, yeah. kind of toffee-like nose. Uh, 
There's fruit in there too, but the toffee uh, character of it is so great. And you know, having tasted you know some great wines, you know, Cabernet Franc wines from Chino mm -hmm. that can really age, and you, you, they really can age. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Bergerac is in the other area that right. I think about totally underrated, but it's actually where foie gras is probably the best yeah, thing true. in there. And Bergerac, and you you have that Cabernet Franc from there, you're like, oh, damn, this is really good. Yep. Um, and I feel like that's kind of the character of this wine. Is it's just like you need something like foie gras. You yeah, need you something do. like duck um, in general you do. with this. And, and it would be a really good duck dish um, up here and here. This is, by by contrast to the 214, um, this has always been more rustic, uh, a little bit more old school. I was also making wines yep. a little differently, yep. you know, in 2010 than I do today. Um, the the new oak was really small. I mean, yeah. it was it was only about ten percent, but it always had a characteristic of um, what you know, kind of what I call franc franc purity. I mean, that's a, a weird thing to say. another good one. Franc purity, right. franc purity. Um, for many years, I think producers in California were trying to m mitigate or minimize some of the what if some of the attributes that Cabernet Franc naturally have because if there was too much of that attribute it would become a disattribute. It's like yeah. when something's too sweet or when you jump on a trampoline for too long. Yeah. I mean these are pleasurable things but if they're in excess it doesn't work. And with Cabernet Franc um, it's always been said that it has very high pyrazines and in reality it has about the same amount of pyrazine as Cabernet Sauvignon but the frame of the wine is smaller, it's a little bit more petite, it's a little bit more elegant, it's a little bit less bravado, and mm -hmm. so it tends to expose the pyrazine quicker. Yeah. So I remember in conversations with Tony Soder, he said, you know, you're basically sort of, you know, gliding on a, on a razor's edge. You want enough of the pyrazine to create the yeah. structure and the herbaceousness that yeah. you need that makes it go with so yeah. many foods. But you don't want to take it over to the vegetative characteristics. No. So. No. And I think that's a really big thing. I think people have really learned how to farm it better and mm -hmm. when to pick it better. Because I think that was the problem is people just weren't seeing that. And it was a little bit green. I mean, it it, was. Uh, and since, it was, since the past seven years have happened, it's on a different planet now. Yeah, um, you've always been the leader of this. Um, I mean, Thank you, in my opinion. <laughs> but there are so many other good offerings out there. There definitely that, are. That have really come about. Some of them are because of you. I mean, like this Spring Mountain, like I forget who it was, and you said, oh yeah, there's a clone up there, and there's this old cutting, and you need some cuttings off that, and you need to do this, and I mean, the guy did some stuff for others, too. You know, so it's just, it's an amazing thing what's really happened with Cabernet Franc, and I feel like this is the, one of my gurus of Cabernet Franc, no doubt, in the world, you, um, right here, and I think that all of us uh, you know, that come here to Napa Valley respect, you know, what you've done. You've made it into a craft, whereas I think a lot of people didn't take it very seriously, this variety. And and now it is a very serious variety, and, and we're finding things. What I loved is that one tasting that we did that was blind, where I threw in, I'm the only one that knew what it was, what was what was in which bag, and I and I set it up, and, and the one that won over Sheenon and some other ones, was actually the one from Pride Mountain and mm -hmm. Sally Johnson. And if you guys saw the show that I did with Sally Johnson, I had her bring that Cabernet Franc out because I wanted to taste it again. Because <laughs> it's really good. 